uh, our next talk is going to be new selection tools for Indicus Influence Cattle uh, by Mr. John Janot. Uh, John uh, is the, leads the genetic prediction group at Neogen's GeneSeq operation, where he specializes in genetic evaluations for beef cattle. Uh, current customers of this uh, include the majority of the Indicus influence breeds in the U.S., as well as many large commercial cattle ranches and international groups. In addition, John assists in managing a 1,000 head commercial cow herd in Virginia. John has a B.S. in animal science from Brigham Young University, an MS in animal breeding and genetics from Cornell University, with a mi minor in biometrics and statistics, and an MBA from Duke University. Uh, John, I want to point out, is just finishing up his second term on the BIF board, where we really appreciate uh, John's service there. And uh, John and I share a little bit. You, you see the palm tree down there. We, we still, this was supposed to be in Florida, and, and John and I both uh, have deep ancestry into Florida. I, I know I, I go back, I'm a fourth generation born Floridian, and uh, I'm not sure if John was born there or not, but I know he has deep roots in Florida as well. Uh, and, and that's another reason that we really wanted to keep this talk. There was a lot of Indicus influence talks when it was going to be in Florida, uh, but we ended up uh, a lot of those actually didn't stay with the program when we went to this uh, uh, format, but we wanted for this uh, session, we wanted, still wanted to give and, and keep this uh, good Indicus influence talk uh, for, for a lot of our friends out there that uh, this has special meaning for. So with that, John, I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm not sure. I guess Bob probably has to give you control, but uh, it's all yours, buddy, and appreciate you coming on and giving this talk. All right, not a problem. Thank you, Dare, and uh, thanks for that introduction. We do share some things in common, being, um, uh, you know, a, I'm a sixth generation uh, Floridian, um, but you can see from my pictures that we have some things not in common, uh, like our ability to, uh, to to grow quite as much hair. So, uh, so yeah, you good good job keeping that, and uh, that was that was actually a, a ver very good break uh, from from genetics talk for just a minute to uh, to, to see that flashback of pictures. So uh, it's, it's good to be able to present. I do miss BIF being able to be there in person at the BIF meetings. That's something I look forward to every year. Um, I'm, I'm glad I'm able to present in a meeting that was supposed to be held in Florida. Um, and also to have that, uh, um, to see that sponsorship by the, by the Brahman Association. I, I've uh, worked with them for several years now and, and enjoy the, the relationship I have there. So Bob, can I advance these slides or do I need to, uh, or do you advance them? You can. Okay, it looks like I can do it. Did. Yeah, I did. You got it. Good job. Thanks. So, th so these are um, some of the some of the um, Indicus Influence customers that I'm that I work with uh, currently in our genetic prediction group. You see, one of those is the American Brahmin Breeders Association. Uh, we work at the Brangus Association, Brayford Beefmaster, Santa Gertrudis with Deseret Ranches, and with King Ranch, and. Um, if you look through that list, I, I think we capture uh, just about all of the Indicus influenced uh, genetic evaluations that are, are performed in the United States and in our group. And so we've worked with, with many of these for several years. And, and the bottom line I wanted to point out here was that uh, Neogen has a stake in, in genetic prediction for Indicus influenced breeds. And um, I also have a stake in that. I, you know, personally, that's, that's where I'm from. And I, and I believe in this as a, uh, you know, as, as an important aspect of the of the uh, industry in the United States. So I, I wanted to do a polling question now, and I wanted to ask everybody, this is the interactive part here, um, why aren't Indicus cattle used more across the United States? And so um, so just to answer, answer this first question here, please, but, but what's the... Uh, what are the uh, what are the reasons that Indicus cattle are not used more across the United States? If you all want to um, take just a minute um, and and vote for that, vote on that. I don't know if uh, if Bob, if I guess you you have to be the one that closes that off. It looks like we have uh, most people that have voted. Yeah, 
uh, still a few coming in here, John. Okay. So the, the first option is carcass quality, fertility, limited access to genetics, or bull producers, meaning you may not have options in your area, docility, tradition, or other are the, are the options. Yeah, and John, I, I was unable to get it changed from uh, multi-choice to single, so you might just, uh, everybody that's listening, uh, John was trying to get uh, the main uh, reason, so if you would just click one, if you've clicked more than one, you can unclick them, so um, just narrow your choice to one, if you would, please. Sorry about that, John. That's okay, no problem, thanks for putting it together. All right, if it looks like we have most of our votes in. Uh, All right. Be interesting to see the results here. All right, so 59% of the, uh, the respondents said carcass quality. 23% uh, uh, said fertility. 15% limit, said limited access. To, to genetics or, or to bull options. 24% said docility, 26% said tradition, and 11% said other. And I, I'd be interested, if you said other, I'd be interested in putting in, it into the, the chat box. I'm, um, I don't know if we'll be able to address it here, but it'd, it'd be interesting to, uh, to hear what you say. We'll save these other, uh, these other polling questions for the, um, for the later in the presentation. Great, holler at me and I'll relaunch that, John. Okay, that sounds good. So, uh, so we talked about some of the reasons why people don't use Indicus Influence Genetics. Um, I wanted to talk for just a few minutes about why to use Indicus Influence um, Genetics. I have this, uh, this book, Breeding Beef Cattle for Unfavorable Environments, in my office here. And um, this was a book that was presented by the, um, at the uh, King Ranch Centennial Conference. That would have been in 1953. And it was edited by Albert Rode, who I didn't realize it, but was a, uh, was a Cornell graduate. And he was in the class about 70 years before uh, Dr. Weber and I, so, uh, so just, just a few years before. If you, if you glance at that picture, I think that that shows why, um, why Indicus cattle are used in the, in the United States. That's, that would be South Texas in the 1940s. And that clearly is a pretty harsh, unfavorable environment. Um, South Texas today has more brush, but it's still pretty harsh and unfavorable. Uh, the ranches that we were set up to tour as part of the BIF uh, conference in, in Central Florida have some pretty, pretty unfavorable environments. This, this picture was taken just a few miles from my office here in Virginia. And you might look at that picture and say, that does not look harsh or unfavorable, that looks like lush green pasture and a beautiful sunrise. Um, but all of those blades of grass you're seeing in that picture are Kentucky 31 tall fescue. Um, and many of you probably know that that's, uh, almost all of that is, endophyte, is in, infected with an endophyte that causes uh, animals to not be able to, to circulate their blood as well. And uh, in the summertime, cattle have a hard time cooling down, especially on a, on a hot, sticky Virginia day. And so even though this looks like a lush, nice, you know, soft environment, this is actually, this actually can be a pretty harsh environment, both in summer and winter because of that, um, because of that infected fescue. And, and Indicus cattle handle it better. They can handle, especially in the summertime, they handle um, toxic fescue better. And so, you know, why to use an Indicus influence cattle is, is to meet the harshness or the, uh, or the um, difficulties caused by unfavorable environments. So here's the question. Can breeders of indicus influence cattle overcome the negatives, whether those are real or perceived negatives, either way, can they overcome those while maintaining the positives? And um, if you ask that question to me, a geneticist, I'm going to tell you the answer is absolutely yes. Um, you know, I, I, I believe that, that elephants and mice can, uh, both are descended from the same primordial soup, and uh, um, it took millions of years for an elephant to become an elephant, but, uh, but genetic change is possible. 
Um, that's, that's what I believe. Um, it really is a matter of time. It's a matter of the tools that we have. It's a matter of the, uh, the pressure we're willing to put on certain traits. Um, it's, it's not a matter of if we can. It, it's a matter of how much effort do we want to put into it, how much do we want to invest in it, and are we willing to take the time to do it? Those are the, those are the real questions. So what I wanted to do for a few minutes is just walk through what some of the, these uh, um, partners of, of, of ours are doing to, to uh, develop tools for, for Indicus Influence Cattle. So I wanted to start by, by talking about some of the things that King Ranch has worked on over the past, past few years. So King Ranch breeds um, Santa Gertrudis cattle. It's the ranch where the, the breed was, was created. Um, and uh, a few years ago, this would have been in, in about 2000 to 2005, uh, they made the determination that they needed to improve uh, marbling scores and quality grade. And so they built a selection program that would allow them to uh, that would allow them to, to work on this. And in 2005, I started to run a genetic evaluation for them. And what I have plotted here is the genetic trend from I guess we picked 2007 through 2019. And if you look at the bottom uh, set of blue dots, those are the marbling EPDs over that time period. Um, if you look at that, uh, each year they were able to roughly increase. The, um, the, the quality grade by one-tenth uh, of an IMF score. And there's some wobble. There are years that are up and years that are down uh, based on breeding decisions and all of these uh, other things that are going on. But it's about a, a tenth of, a, um, of an IMF score. Now, one of the things that, um, that geneticists sometimes do is they point to, uh, to genetic trends in EPDs and say, well, this is, uh, this is what's happened. And, and the ranch immediately says, well, that's not what happened. That's your prediction. And so let's look at some real data. And so what I did at the top here is I, pl I plotted actual um, carcass or actual scan IMF scores on, uh, on yearling bulls. And of course, this has variations in feeding rations and the age of scan and all of these things, these, you know, that influence IMF scores. But um, but so these are just raw scores, and you can see that uh, that we're pretty close in our predictions of what they of how much they should have improved. They've improved by about a tenth of a of an IMF score a year, which would mean they'd move in that 15 year period um, since this all started. They'd move about one and a half um, one and a half scores. So if you if you think about this in percent choice, the blue curve here would be the the cattle in, in 2005, those cattle graded about 35% choice. Um, the average IMF score would have, or the average marbling score would have been about, on carcass marbling, would have been about 300, 365 to 370. Um, today, with where they're at today, um, they grade about 85% choice when they're fed similar to rations. And, um, and, the, and the, the average marbling scores are, are in the upper 400s. And so you, you know there's a lot of noise here in how cattle are fed and rations and age, but, uh, but they've consistently been able to make this amount of progress and show that, you, that they can have tropically adapted um, cattle who can deal with those harsh environments, but are able to marvel. Um, this is just a matter of selection. So you can ask, how, how did they do this? Um, uh, you know, the, the, uh, I think there were three things they did. Number one, they gathered data and they kept their pedigree straight. So they, they started off by just making sure that they were collecting marbling scores. They were ultrasounding bulls. Um, they tagged calves and uh, did sire matching by DNA to make sure that they had the pedigree straight. They invested in genomics. Um, we did the, the single step genomic model in, in 2012 using single step GBLUP. Um, we used, uh, and we've been doing that since then. Um, they used index selection. Uh, they didn't single trait select. They weren't trying to, to, to win the game and have the highest score, you know, in the, uh, in the EPDs. They were trying to create balanced cattle for their, for their system. Um, and, and to me, one of the things they did that was most important was they had uh, consistency from year to year. Um, so that they decided that this was something they wanted to focus on. And for 15 years, they focused on it. And you can see the amount of progress they made. Now, one of the things they've focused on over the past several years is maternal traits and um, whether or not they're able to, 
to improve uh, and, and I guess putting selection pressure on, on maternal traits. Um, we run a heifer pregnancy EPD for them. We run a stability to two, uh, so a breed back EPD. We run a stability to five and then have, have cow weight EPDs. And all of those flow together into a, into a maternal index that uh, the balances uh, moderate framed cattle um, uh, in, in, a, in a harsh environment with, uh, with, stay, with being able to stay in the herd and, uh, and breed as heifers. So overall, I've been impressed with their ability to make, to make progress and to, um, and, and to, and to retain this, uh, this ability to adapt to a harsh environment. I wanted to talk for a minute about a different, uh, a, a different partner of ours, and that's the International Brangus Breeders Association. So the, uh, the Brangus Breeders um, decided several years ago they wanted to create an EPD that's a, an age at first calf EPD. And this is a prediction of the days and age a cow will be when her first calf is born. So if, if I have two contemporaries, two, two females that are born in the same calf crop, and um, they grow up together and they're bred together, um, which one of them calves at an earlier age? So this is a, um, a proxy for, for age at puberty, which is, um, which is difficult to measure in, 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 large, uh, in large populations. Um, the heritability of this is about 22% when we look at, at whole herd reporting records. Um, uh, the interesting thing about this is, that the, is when you look at the genetic correlations. So the correlation to mature, the genetic correlation to mature cow weight is about 35%, meaning uh, larger cows tended to have calves later, their first calf later in life, which would tell us small frame cows or moderate frame cows, we should say, are, uh, are, are better able to deal with the, um, with what we're asking them to do and to, and to breed earlier. There's a negative correlation to scrotal circumference, which means the, uh, the higher the scrotal circumference, the early, uh, a bull has, the larger the scrotal circumference of a bull, the, uh, the earlier his daughters will breed. Uh, back fat had a positive correlation and milk had a positive correlation, meaning, meaning fat, heavy milking cattle were more likely to breed later. And all of that, I think, sort of makes sense logically when you think about developing heifers. They've also developed several other EPDs, a stability EPD. Um, which is the probability that the cow will still be in the herd at five years old in the whole herd reporting system. The heritability of that is about 16%. We developed a heifer pregnancy EPD, uh, which is the probability a cow will, will, will calve as a heifer given she was exposed, and that's about a 19% heritability. And a mature cow weight EPD, which is centered at five years old at a, at a constant body condition score, and that's about a 25% heritability. And all of these EPDs flow together into a maternal index. And uh, uh, here I show the coefficients, which I think are informative, and also the correlations, which I think are, are more important. Um, the important thing here is that, is that we're putting a lot of pressure on stability and heifer pregnancy, and we're holding cow weight constant. Um, so we're trying to change heifer pregnancy and, and, and stability without drastically changing the weight of the, uh, the, the size of the cows. One of the things we do in the Brangus Maternal Index is we express this in standard deviations. Um, so, the, uh, so an index value of one is actually one standard deviation above the average for the index. And, and I really like this because that means that if I see a, a zero, um, an index of zero, I know that's right on average. If I see an index of two, I know that that's in the top 5%. I see an index of minus 2. I know it's in the bottom 5%. Um, hasn't been quite as easy to sell that all, all of the breeders on that. I think some who understand standard deviations like that, and some it's, it's more confusing. But, but I think that that's been an interesting way to express, um, express an index in standard deviations. So I wanted to talk for a few minutes about the Brahmin uh, breeders and what they've done to, uh, to address some of these some of these uh, concerns we all voted on just a minute ago. Um, one of the, the traits that the, the Brahmin associations worked on is, is docility. And so they have a score that ranges from one to five with one being the calmest and, and five being the least calm. Um, 
we only accept those scores when they're collected at weaning. Um, and here uh, you can see the, uh, the heritability of docility is about 29%. And as I was actually surprised for a score collected by, by breeders, a score that, that could be seen as being, as being uh, pretty, uh, you know, pretty very variable depending on the breeder that's collecting the score. This is actually very heritable, um, which I was pretty impressed with. It's interesting, if you look at the distribution of the scores, though, you can see that most animals score as a one or two. And so, uh, um, and really, if you think about a one versus a two, we probably are all okay with an animal that scores one or two. Maybe the two is a little less sure about us, uh, but what we really don't want is we really don't want a four or a five. Uh, you know, a five is the one that, that, that runs you over, and a, and a four is the one that, that, that looks like she's going to. And so, you know, we'd rather not have those cattle. We're probably okay with ones and twos, and a few threes are probably okay with this. So one of the things we did is instead of expressing this EPD as, um, as, a, as a continuous trait, meaning, uh, you know, a, a, a range on this, on this score, scoring system, what we did is we express, express the EPD as the probability that the animal is docile, meaning that higher is better. So if you look at, at genetic progress and docility um, over the last uh, 10 years in the, in the Brahmin Association, the blue lines are the, are the raw scores, the blue dots and the blue line is the raw score. So from 2008, in 2008, the average score that was submitted was about an uh, average rate about two. Uh, today, the score averages closer to, to 1.6. Um, and, and so they've been able to make some pretty consistent progress in bringing the average of those scores down. But I think the more impressive thing is the, is the percent of the scores that are turned in that are either a four or a five. And so if you, if you look in uh, 2008, about 6% of the scores that were turned in were a four or a five. Um, if you look at that today, uh, less than 2% of the scores that are turned in are a four or a five. And, uh, and across thousands of record being, records being turned in a year, a year, I think that this represents real genetic progress that um, those breeders have, have made. Um, I wanna, wanted to also put the, um, the average EPDs, um, uh, meaning the problem, and this is the, the probability that an animal will be docile. And you can see that those EPDs have, have increased pretty consistently by about uh, 0.1 percentage points per year. Um, and so in that, that roughly 10 year period, they've been able to increase the probability that an animal, the average animal in the herd will be docile by about a, by about a um, one percentage point. And to me, again, that represents real genetic progress that, that uh, the Brahman Association has been able to make. One of the most interesting things to me is that in, in the ABBA data, and I know this is in other data, you'll find these results, but when we analyze this in the ABBA data, um, the correlation between tenderness and docility, the genetic correlation, I should say, between tenderness and docility is about a, a, a 25, is about 25%, meaning, um, meaning more tender animals will be um, more docile. And, um, and, and, and so I, I think that that's an incredibly important idea as we, uh, as we deal with some of, the, um, some of the stereotypes we have about Indicus influenced cattle not being tender. Um, as we improve docility, we also can improve tenderness. And tenderness is another trait that the Brahman Association's invested in, in collecting phenotypes on and developing EPDs for, that I, that I think has uh, um, driven, driven a lot of change in their, in their breed. I wanted to talk for just a minute about the Brief Master Breeders. Uh, and here's where I wanted to do the next polling question, Bob, if we can, uh, if we can tee that one up. So I wanted to ask, what are the foundation breeds and percentages of beef master cattle? Um, the first option is a quarter Hereford, quarter Brahmin, uh, or quarter Shorthorn, half Brahmin. Second option is three eighths Brahmin, five eighths Shorthorn and Hereford. Uh, third option is quarter Hereford, quarter Shorthorn, half boss indicus, and, uh, and the fourth option is nobody knows. So um, I, ha I have the, uh, I don't know if we want to key that back up, Bob, or we could use the results from, from the previous voting.
Let's see, I have the results from the previous um, from the previous voting, and it and it looks like 38 percent of the people answered um, number one, uh, quarter quarter Hereford, quarter Shorthorn, half Brahmin. Uh, 34 percent answered number two. 11 uh, percent answered number three, and the and 17 percent answered nobody knows number four. And and I, and I think you could probably say the correct answer should be number three. Um, when the Beefmaster breed was developed, it was developed by the by Tom Lasseter at the at uh, Lasseter Ranch in South Texas. Um, they had Her Hereford and Shorthorn, um, but they didn't really have Brahmin. They had Nalor, Gear, and Gujarat, and uh, maybe some Afrikander. So they had several different um, uh, several different Boss Indicus breeds, but they didn't necessarily have. Um, uh, they didn't necessarily have just uh, you know just Brahmin cattle that went into that into that cross. Um, however, you you might also uh, you might also be able to say um, that the um, that number four is the correct answer. That no nobody knows. Um, uh, you know when they when they blended those those breeds, they didn't necessarily track what the percentages were, and so uh, so that the actual mix is. Uh, it was anybody's guess until we until we had uh, you know genomic technology to go in and, and pick apart breeds and there's been some interesting studies in that in that space to show where the things have gone. So the um, the Beefmaster Association's working right now on a calving interval EPD, and the idea here is that is that given a cow is calved within the first two and a half years of life, um, how many days until our second calf? How many days will it be until our second calf is born? Um, we're also working on an RFI EPD. They have several breeders that have invested um, uh, in feed efficiency equipment, and uh, they're also building a stability EPD, and and uh, um, which is stability to five years of age. And one of the interesting things has been looking at the correlation between those um, those new EPDs. Um, it's interesting that if the uh, if you look at the calving interval EPD, um, the the animals who bred um, had a high, uh, who bred earlier their first time had a long longer interval to breed into their second time, um, but you you saw a positive correlation to the stability EPD, and so we're right now working through all of these things to develop a, a maternal selection index or add these to their maternal selection index to uh, to come up with a, a good prediction of of the maternal ability of these of these cattle, and I wanted to uh, talk for just a minute with about this last group, the Santa Gertrudis um, Breeders International. Uh, this is the genetic trend of uh, growth traits for the for the Santa Gertrudis Association. If you look at the yellow the yellow line, um, you can see that they've they've made improvements in in yearling weight, the orange line in weaning weight. If you look at birth weight, that's nearly flat um, across the uh, across the period that we're looking at. And so that, I think that shows uh, they've been able to make a lot of progress. If you look back to about 2013, you can see that there was a there was an event there that caused a pretty major and, and dramatic shift in in the uh, in the um, uh, slope of that line. And, and that event was the release of their genomic enhanced EPDs. It's interesting that before genomic enhanced EPDs, they were increasing yearling weight at a rate of about 0.16 pounds per year. Um, after genomic enhanced EPDs, the slope of that line is about 1.68. Um, so they, they are, were moving about 10 times faster <laughs> on, this, uh, on this curve with genomic enhanced EPDs than they were before genomic enhanced EPDs. Now that probably represents more than just the value of genomics. Probably represents breeders submitting data and getting behind numbers and actually, uh, you know, using all of the tools available to them. And so I, I think there's a lot that's encapsulated in that beyond just genomics. But it's interesting that that, that was a, a turning point in the uh, in the association where they really adopted the use of the technology and decided they would make changes with those uh, with that technology. This is the uh, trend for fertility traits, and I just pulled this for breeders that submitted records. Um, so this is kind of a biased sample. 
if you look, we have scrotal circumference, um, heifer pregnancy, and I also put in here breed back, which would be um, uh, the probability she'll breed as a three-year-old, give or calve as a three-year-old, given she calved as a two-year-old. And so just to pick one apart, I wanted to pick out this, this breed back EPD. Um, and so you can see the trend for that has been, has been about a, a tenth of a percentage point per year, which is a, um, you know, is, is, is a small number now, but I think is, uh, is heading in the right direction. So what about commercial cattle? Um, Neogen right now is working on um, selection tools for, uh, for commercial cattle, and, and soon we should have a, an Igenity product that's prepared, we're prepared to release for, uh, for um, selecting commercial cattle in, in um, uh, commercial Indicus influence cattle. So in, in conclusion, I, I wanted to just talk about, uh, put this slide up here. Um, you know, I, I think is, is uh, our human minds are pretty good at dealing with averages. That's the way we tend to think. Um, if you have two breeds that are, uh, um, and one is superior for a certain trait, and one is inferior for that trait, we tend to think, okay, all, all of the superior breed are better for that trait, and all of the inferior breed are worse for the, for the trait. That's not necessarily the case. Um, you know, rather than an average, we really should be thinking in distributions. And I think this is more often what happens. Um, there, are, there are curves and there are animals um, in that inferior breed that could pass some threshold of acceptability. And then the superior breed, there are gonna be some inferior animals that shouldn't, that shouldn't be selected. Um, so, so to me, this is an, an incredibly important idea. There are Indicus influence cattle that, uh, that, that have um, fabulous, like absolutely amazing uh, carcass um, performance. We just need to find them. There are animals that have fertility, or animals that are docile. Um, all of these biases we have against Indicus-influenced cattle, we can correct, and we can find animals that, 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 that meet, those, uh, meet those needs. Um, we just need to, number one, give breeders the tools to, to, uh, you know, to develop those traits. Number two, allow them to, to make, those, uh, make those selections that allow them to improve those traits. And I, and I think what we're seeing right now is we're seeing that happening. As, as uh, breeders of Indicus influence cattle have adopted these, these tools, we're seeing them make progress in carcass quality and in, in, uh, in fertility and in, in docility. And, and hopefully we can uh, begin to overcome some of the tradition and, and, um, and, and see the use of these cattle spread. And, uh, and I think that that's important for two reasons. Number one, it's important because there are harsh environments throughout the United States where, where, where these cattle will perform and they'll perform very well. Um, this is the other thing that I think is important. Um, I think the loss from decreased heterosis and straight bred cattle don't make up for the gains uh, that you get from breeding straight bred cattle. This is some data I presented on stability last year at BIF. Um, uh, uh, this was for, for uh, heterosis versus genomic heterosis versus stability to four years old. And for every, uh, for every um, one percentage point increase in in stability, we saw, or in, in, in heterosis, we saw a 1.14 increase in the probability that that animal would stay in the herd to four years of age. Um, you know, for most of the, the, the traits that really bring economic value to a ranch, um, heterosis is, is an amazing tool that I think is more and more underused um, right now. And so, and, and Indicus influence cattle bring a whole different uh, dynamic to the heterosis, um, I think, in, in any part of the country. So with that, I'll take any questions. All right, John, thank you very, very much. Uh, I, I guess we'll, um, we'll start off by everybody remember to type your questions in the, the question and answer section down there, and, uh, and then we can get to them. If, if you would like, you can put them in the chat. I'll check that out here in a little bit, too, but uh, we prefer those to go in the Q&A part, if you don't mind. Um, I don't know if you might want to comment on this, but Joe uh, Pascal um, made a, a statement when you put the first poll up that, that most of those reasons are perceptions, um, and, and so uh, any comments about, uh, about Joe's observation there? I, I, I think I think you're absolutely right, Joe. I think most of those are perceptions. 
And at times I've been frustrated with that and said we need to uh, change people's perceptions. <laughs> but, but I think if they're, if they're, uh, if they're perceptions or, or whether they're real, we, we still can develop tools that can, can answer them. And, and I'm, I'm as excited as can be because I've, I've seen the associations doing that. I've seen the ranches doing that. I've seen breeders doing that. Yeah, I, I, I often use the phrase, uh, John, and it's unfortunate, but, but a lot of times uh, perception is reality. I mean, we have to deal with what the perceptions are and, and handle them either through education or in, improving the perception. Yeah, yep. Uh, okay, uh, FJ Jordan asks the question, uh, what is the required age for Brahma to collect phenotypes for carcass traits, especially for marbling and maybe required condition score for animals on natural pastures? So, so for the American Brahmin breeders, most of the, uh, most of the phenotypes are, are, most of the carcass phenotypes are from uh, steer feed outs. So these would be animals that are going through a, um, going through a, a, a um, you know, an actual feed out. And so, uh, so they wouldn't be coming off of pastures. Um, I'd have to look up the, uh, the ages. I don't remember them offhand, but for all of these breeds, the age windows are, are, um, are expanded a little bit beyond what BIF would typically recommend um, or what a, what a, a Taurus animal would, would usually, um, the age windows for Taurus animals. Um, they're just, you know, they're, they, they, and whether that's because of the breeders develop them slower or, or the animals uh, mature slower, either way, those, those animals are, are, are pushed back just a little bit. All right. Uh, Michael Bradfield asked, are you using the 35K SNP or all the tropical composites? For all of the tropical composites. So we're we're using um, we're using the um, uh, the GGP 50k or or 100k. So it's not the 35k Indicus chip that we're using for the tropical composites. You know the, these cattle are um, when we look at them at a gen, at the genomic level they're, they're 30 37 38 percent or less Indicus. And so there, there, are, there are a lot more Taurus genes than there are um, Indicus genes floating around in there. And so, so we found plenty of, of segregation and variability in, the, um, in, a, in a traditional Taurus chip. The one exception there for the breeds that I work with is the Brahmin Association. Um, that one we're recommending the, um, an Indicus specific chip. Okay. Uh... Matt Spangler over in the chat side asked, uh, were the EPD for weaning weight and yearling weight post genomics inflated? In other words, over dispersed. Um, those, uh, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I'd have to dig back through that. Um, you know, what I, from what I've seen of them being, uh, you know the studies that have shown that their the genomics disperse over disperses the EPDs. Those are centered back towards zero as the animal matures and data comes in. Um, I, I don't I don't think we've seen that happening. I think I, so. I don't think we have an issue with those being being over over dispersed. Um, you know, and, and 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 if we did, that dispersion should be going both ways, um, up and down. And we're we're seeing we're seeing you know still seeing good upward progress. Okay, um, we have uh, we have a question from so Sophie Eaglin. Uh, do you think Taurus animals with a bred in or edited slick gene are a realistic future threat for Indicus animals? There you go, John. There you're on the spot. <laughs> you know, I think that's a great question. Yeah, I, I like that. You know, I, I think there's probably some uh, some opportunities in some in something like this, and I and I hope that um, you know, I, I hope that people keep working on it and trying it, and and I'm a fan of gene editing, and uh, you know, I think it's ridiculous that we can't really do it right now. Um, however, I don't I, I think tropical adaptation is more complicated than just a single gene. Um, uh, you know, I I, I think it, it has to do with loose skin. It has to do with uh, with bigger ears. It has to do with 
with, with all of these phenotypes that are controlled by a whole host of genes. And, and so, you know, I, I think when you lose the phenotype, you're going to lose tropical adaptation. Um, you know, there's, and so, so I think it's more complicated, I guess, is, is, is what I would say. Now, that's not based on data. That's my perception of the problem. You know, and if, and if we can, if we can edit in a slick gene and, and, and make everything work, I think that would be great. But I think in the near future, it's not a, it's not a threat. All right. All right. Donald Brown, Donald's uh, bored out there, locked up in COVID, I guess. Uh, <laughs> he wants to know, I would appreciate your thoughts on why the commercial industry has moved towards straight breeding and away from the scientifically proven advantages of crossbreeding and heterosis. What is your prediction for this trend in the future? I, I think that's a very good question. I, I, I have my, uh, my, I have my thoughts, but I don't know exactly why. You know, I, I really think a lot of it is, is that, is that most, most um, cattle um, uh, production is, um, is a, either a, um, a part-time job or a, uh, in, in the United States is a part-time job or something that's an afterthought to another, another enterprise. And straight breeding is just easier. It's, it's just easier to just go buy a bull. And, uh, and most herds are, are, are small enough that doing any kind of a crossbreeding program, it, it gets pretty complicated. Um, you know, really, unless you get over, unless you're able to have two or three different groups, how, how, do, you, how do you manage a, a crossbreeding program? And so I, I, think that, um, I, think, I think that's probably really at the core of this. And, um, and I know all of the geneticists on the, uh, you know, on, on the uh, um, in this meeting would say um, would would say that they you know that they talked and talked about uh, about crossbreeding, but have, but haven't had the same amount of uh, or haven't had the response from the industry that they would have liked, and I and I'm in that that spot as well. But I, but I really think it's because it's easier to just buy bulls, and I I think the opportunity is for is is for people selling bulls. And so I'll turn the question back to you, Donnell, is is for people selling bulls to be able to sell a program that enables crossbreeding to be easy. You know, I, I think that that's the opportunity and that that's the, the void that we have to fill to really make this work. All right, uh, Donald followed that up with, as cattlemen in Florida have moved away from Boss Indicus genetics and toward more Taurus genes, it appears that their cattle have reduced fertility, adaptability, and lifetime productivity. How much of this is due to less Boss Indicus and how much is due to less heterosis? I want to hear exact percentages here, John. <laughs> no, I, I can make something up. <laughs> Two decimal points. Uh, I would say it's probably more a loss of boss indicus genes and, and less a loss of heterosis. That would be my opinion. Um, I think if you took, um, you know, the, the, the black baldies were the, the classic uh, cross here in Virginia. Um, and, and I think they probably set up well to do well in, in traditional Virginia environments. I think if you took those to Florida, they're probably just not going to do very well because they don't have indicus. And, and so I think all, in, in Florida and South Texas and those types of environments, you, know, it, you, you just need some bot indicus to make sure that you can, can handle those harsh environments. And then uh, George Jara, I think he was re, uh, actually asking this along with uh, Donald's first question is, are composite breeds one solution? Yeah, and I think I agree with that. I, I think that's a good solution. I, and I think as, as, as people offer composite breeds, they're offering a solution for, especially for breeders that aren't able to maintain a really good crossbreeding program. Um, so I, I, I think that's a, I think that's a, a good solution. I think other solutions are, you know, use this bull this year and bring them back next year and get that one. You know, I don't, I don't know what all of the business ideas, ideas could be that could, uh, could make this work, but I think there probably are, are several different uh, solutions. But I think composite breeds are actually a good solution here. Um, that's all I'm seeing on here, John, but I, I actually have a technical question or two for you if I could. Um, you talked about it, and first of all, I, I'm going to tell you right now, I, I am was so excited to see 
uh, some of the efforts that many of the Indicus breeds are, are taking on, on some, uh, some shots at, at this reproduction deal, because I'm going to be honest with you, that's probably of my career, the biggest disappointment I have is that we haven't made more progress with good solid EPDs for reproductive traits, and, and I'm really happy to see that that you guys are making some efforts there uh the one and i and i know part of that is 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 some of the struggles at at you know defining what a great uh reproductive epd might be uh the actual trait to to try and measure and, and the ones that you guys are tackling the the question i always have uh is uh, on, on the on the, the the first one where the age at first calf and even the calving interval one how do you handle with a closed breeding season when they don't get pregnant you know what, how do you handle that in the data so so what we do uh there i think it's a good question what we do is we 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 do a slice on the birth dates of the animals so if um you know, so let's say somebody's running a spring and a fall program, and they and they try to breed. Uh, so a heifer breeds her first time, and they try to breed her a second time, and she misses, and so they roll roll her over to a fall program. Um, well, well, we only allow um, the actual birth dates for those for those animals in that contemporary group group to be 90 days or 60 days or something like that. And so that animal would fall out of her contemporary group and, and she could then be compared to other animals that have been rolled to a fall program, but, but she, she wouldn't be compared, um, uh, you know, because of, because of her failure in that, to, to breed in, in that second spring season. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it gets, it gets complicated when you start. And and then is that the for the calving interval? Um, is that handled some way through contemporary groups as well? Yeah. Get, yep. So that'd be age at first calving calving interval. We yeah. I, I think the really important thing is those age slices, so that you only allow you only allow animals that have had calves within a certain period of each other to be compared. Okay. Yeah, because it, otherwise you might have an animal that's a hundred and. 50 days away from all of her peers. Well, that, that's not real. Something different happened to her. So if you have a bull that's producing extremely infertile females, though, is that not a problem? Because they might not ever show up in the data set at all. Um, no, you're right. Yeah, you, you lose you lose the ability to penalize animals that never breed. Yeah. That's, you're exactly right. Okay, one one last one from my part, unless we have another question to pop up from from the audience. But um, what is that uh, the breed back EPD? I, I'm not familiar with that one. You know, we we named we named it breed back. Um, that's that was that was actually King Ranch's name for it. But but it's given she breeds as a um, given she breeds as her first time. What's the probability she'll breed her second time? So you could actually call it um, you could actually call it a uh, a stability to two years old, or stability to their second breeding. So I think is that similar to the Gelvy has the uh, preg thirty. Is that and I think that's same thing. Assuming they bred the first time, are they rebred at thirty months of age? Is yeah, that yep, similar, that'd be yeah. that'd be, that'd be um, basically the same thing. Yeah, I I think that's a I think that's a a good EPD. I hope we see that one a uh, little more across all the breeds actually. No, I think you're right because the the truth is that a an open heifer is still very valuable. Heifer pregnancy isn't much of an economically relevant trait, I don't think. Um, but an open an open two year old is not very valuable. That's that's the biggest loss. Exactly. I I think it has way more value than heifer pregnancy. But uh, yeah. that, that's just me. All right, John. Well, I really appreciate it, and we're approaching the the top of the hour, so uh, we'll probably let you off the hook here for a little bit and and move on to our next speaker. I'm not sure, Bob, uh, who has control or what happens here. So you got to help me out, buddy. Thanks a lot, John. That was fantastic. I appreciate it. And uh, there may be a few more questions that pop up on the question thing. If you're able to stay with us, if you don't mind answering those uh, by typing the answer, that would be fantastic. All right. Will do. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye-bye. John, thanks, and uh, apologies, I bobbled your slides there a couple of spots. But... <laughs> no problem. Thanks, Bob, for organizing. Yeah.
state of Iowa and Iowa State University are proud to host the 2021 Beef Improvement Federation Annual Research Symposium and Convention. The convention will be located in downtown Des Moines with easy access to the airport, hotels, and local restaurants. Iowa State University is just north with its research and teaching farms. Join us in Iowa and experience how Iowa provides the beef industry with innovation to application. <laughs> 